Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us come to the second week module on this CSS MOOC course on science, technology and society and, and what we have done till now in the last week, we discussed the way technology, science and society have been conceived of and the way we have tried to bring about a critical relationship between these three forces of production namely science, technology and society through different models, through different perspectives on STS namely the linear model, the interactionist model and the embedded model. And we have discussed this I mean the, the similarity between linear and the interactionist model suggests that uh, both these models they treat science, technology and society as separate entities whereas, the embedded model suggests that no science and technology are not autonomous activities they are very much a part of society they are, they are very much a part of social formation that is why the relationship between science and technology is, is symbiotic in nature. Okay? And then we discussed how technological determinism, the notion of technological determinism can be challenged, how epistemology can be combined with ethical considerations to bring about philosophy of science and that is the job of STS scholars to bring about a conglomeration of philosophy of science, history of science and sociology of science. And thereon we moved on to how technology is not neutral the neutrality of a technology depends on uh, design and control through uh, I, I provided certain examples of uh, the construction of the New York breeze, the way public roads in India are designed and so on. And then having discussed the ontological uh, questions, what is being, what is existing what is in reality in store, we have uh, come to what ought to be, what should be, what, what is prescriptive, what is normative in nature. And there we discussed Mertonian normative structure of uh, science, Mertonian uh, uh, institutional imperatives, um, Mertonian ethos of modern science. That is why uh, the ethos of science, the way Martin visualized okay, is the effectively toned complex of values and norms which is uh, held to be binding on the man of science. And these norms are expressed in terms of prescriptions, I mean the normative framework as a whole, the then, prescri uh, then uh, after prescriptions, proscriptions, I mean the norms which are legally bound preferences I mean which uh, uh, preferences come under the, the scope and ambit of motivational values and norms, ideals and preferences which uh, come under purview of institutional values and norms and ideals. Okay? And then we discussed the goal of science which is the extension of certified knowledge, then we discussed the imperatives of science which derive from the goal and its methods. When I say when Martin said method, he meant um, in terms of empirically uh, uh, confirmed and uh, logically consistent statements of reg regularities. Okay? This is very important, okay? that is why science always 
starts with science always starts with not simply observable facts, but also verifiable facts. That is why I gave you the example that if I say uh, I have seen a ghost, I just cannot say that uh, uh, that is uh, real, because I have observed that ghost which may not be verified okay, under the scientific real. Then we discussed how Merton flags four institutional imperatives in terms of four ethos of science, namely universalism, communism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. Okay. Now, we have discussed the ontological questions and then we discussed the normative questions. The normative questions have dealt more with, with the goal of science. Okay. If you look at these four uh, ethos ito of modern science, universalism, communism and disinterestedness, they refer to the goals of science. Whereas, organized skepticism is not only a goal of science, but also a methodological uh, mandate. Okay. Then you keep on postponing your judgment unless and until all facts are added. Okay. From this, let us move to from the goal of science, let us move to the methods of science. What may be the possible methods of science? It is not like that uh, there is the method of science, there may be multiple methods of science. We will discuss one by one. And Please remember the question, what is the method of science is as old as science itself. Aristotle worked out a detailed answer to this question and his theory of scientific method like the like his scientific theories exercised tremendous influence till around 16th century. However, with the emergence of modern science and modern philosophy in 17th century, the question what is the method of science was raised a phrase. I mean when I talk about uh, 17th century, 18th century, it is very important to understand uh, the context of the enlightenment, the context of rationality, the context of critical thinking, the context of reasoning capacity, the, uh, the, uh, the context of industrial revolution, uh, I mean changes in the mode of production. Uh, I mean the, the, the ability to interrogate, interrogate the hitherto existing structures and substructures including religion. It was also a question, uh, I mean question, questioning the dominance of church at that time. Okay. This, this question what is the method of science or what may be the possible methods of science. Okay. The very attempt to provide uh, a satisfactory answer to uh, the question amounted to a decisive break with the past, as it implies a dissatisfaction with the Aristotelian theory of scientific method. We thus uh, have in the 17th century the birth of modern philosophy of science. STS scholars are deeply engaged in this. Okay. What kind of methods that we find so far as science is concerned? What kind of methods that the practitioners of science follow? Okay. It is very important. They may amount from uh, different trajectories, different intellectual and political trajectories. Somebody may say, no, X is mortal, X is a man, that is why all men are mortal. Prima is number 1 is X is mortal, Prima is number 2 as an evidence, X is a man, the conclusion is all men are mortal. From particular instance to arrive at a concrete generalization, is often attributed to 
inductivist method. If I just revert it, if I alter it, I will say no, my premise number 1 should be all men are mortal, my premise number 2 should be x is a man, then the conclusion is x is mortal that is hypothesis, because I am trying to start with a hypothesis all men are mortal. Okay? That is a different question that till I and you are alive, how can I come to a conclusion that all men are mortal? That is a separate question altogether, we will come to this point later. Uh, that is a, a dilemmatic situation that is a, such questions have been raised by the proponents of inductivism, they charge hypothesis on many accounts including this one. Okay? And then we come to, then we will discuss positivism, then we will discuss systematic falsifiability uh, by uh, uh, Karl Popper, then uh, we will discuss the structure of scientific revolutions uh, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I mean propounded by Thomas Kuhn and then we will discuss how Feyerabend tried to reject any kind of method, I mean any kind of hitherto existing method. Okay? That is why he wrote against method. Let us start, let us do this exercise one by one. Okay? In the whole period of three centuries, as I said that uh, in the 17th century, we witnessed the birth of modern philosophy of science. Then if I, if we look at this, in the whole period of three centuries from the 17th century to the 19th century two views stand out prominently as answers to the question what is the method of science. These three centuries they tried to answer to this question what is the method of science. They may be the, the first view I mean I mean uh, those, those two views which stand out prominently okay? one is inductivism and the other hypothesis. Inductivism, if you the first view I, as I said is called inductivism, according to which the method of science is the method of induction. The second view is called hypothesis, according to which the method of science is called the method of hypothesis. Okay? Inductivism is pioneered by Francis Bacon, whereas hypothesis is pioneered by Rene Descartes. The two views sought to provide two models of uh, scientific method. Okay? Uh, I mean, uh, when I say uh, the two views sought to provide uh, two models of scientific method. Uh, Perhaps for this reason, uh, one can speak of the Baconian model, I mean, and the Cartesian model of uh, scientific method. I mean, inductivism is known as the Baconian model, uh, whereas hypothesis is known as the Cartesian model of scientific method. Inductivism is rooted in empiricism, according to which only those ideas which are traceable to sense experience are legitimate. What is empiricism then? Now, empiricism is based on experience. Whatever I experience, I create knowledge out of my experience. I mean that is why inductivism is rooted, is based on the empirical method, the, the method, uh, I mean uh, the, the knowledge is based on the knowledge uh, born out of experiences. That is why I said em, inductivism is rooted in empiricism according to which only those ideas which are traceable to sense experience are legitimate. Okay? In science, we always try to make legitimate explanation, valid explanation. Okay? If you look at hypothesis, it is grounded, it is rooted in rationalism according to which 
a significant portion of human knowledge cannot be traced to and therefore, is independent of sense experience. It is interesting to see. Suppose, you will find in this space now there is proton electron. Can we see this? Can we see them? It is beyond our sense experience. Oh, oh, I mean this, this portion of human knowledge is not trace, uh, I mean cannot be traced to and therefore, uh, is independent of sense experience. It does not imply that there is no proton or electron here. There is proton and electron here, but it is beyond our sense experience. That is why we deploy the method of rationalism, I mean reasoning capacity. If, if empiricism is based on experience, then rationalism is based on reason. Okay? That is why I repeat inductivism is rooted in empiricism according to which only those ideas which are traceable to sense experience are legitimate, whereas hypotheticism is grounded in rationalism according to which a significant portion of human knowledge cannot be traced to and therefore, is independent of sense experience. Okay? Then let us start with inductivism, then we will go ahead with hypothesism and then we will try to uh, see what kind of controversies uh, uh, these uh, philosophical schools of thought they try to bring about. Inductivism looked upon certainty and breadth as the hallmark of scientific knowledge. There are two things here, one is certainty and the other breadth. It implies that science must aim at knowledge which is definite, which is certain on the one hand and on the other it must have breadth, I mean it must be broad in the sense that it must encompass more and more of the world we seek to know. Okay? The search for certain or definite knowledge led inductivists to legislate that science must confine itself to observations, since it is only our observations that we can be certain. In other words, science according to inductivists must not make reference to anything un unobservable. Whatever I observe, I must believe in that. Whatever is, whatever cannot be observed, I must not believe in that. I must refrain from believing in this kind of thing. If you look at this, this is, uh, this is one is uh, uh, certain. Okay? I mean, uh, only observations. If you look at this, okay, observations, uh, and which is unobservable, we don't want to. Uh, uh, I mean, inductivists they do not want to consider to be legitimate. It implies or this the means the means of realizing knowledge that is brought back on found in the principle of induction, which allows us to go from particular observations to generalizations. That is why I said at the very outset that uh, if I say uh, x is motor premise number 1, premise number 2 is x is a man and the conclusion is mm, uh, all men are mortal. Okay? From particular instance, okay, I tend to arrive at a concrete generalization. Suppose, if I say x is a, a x is mortal, x is a tiger that is why all men are mortal, I cannot make this statement. This is a, this is not a valid statement in logic, in inductive logic. Okay? I must try to provide certain evidence to come to a concrete conclusion, to arrive at a concrete generalization. 
perhaps for this reason according to inductivists science must aim at arrive uh, aim at arriving at with the help of the principle of induction generalizations which cryptically contain knowledge of indefinite number of as yet unmade gen observations i mean then what kind of uh, method that inductivists uh, propose that it starts with observation then we put forward a tentative generalization which we verify i mean observation is x is mortal socrates is mortal okay that is an observation then we put forward a tentative generalization which we verify that socrates is mortal which requires verification and once it is verified that tentative generalization becomes a law enabling us to go from a limited number of already made observations okay i mean then it starts with observation then tentative generalization and then conclusion okay observation tentative generalization and then conclusion okay we first collect observational data without recourse to any theory our observation may deviate from the existing theory our theories may not support our observations that's why we must first try to collect observational data without any recourse to without recourse to any theory we then put forward a tentative generalization which we verify and once it is verified that particular tentative generalization becomes a law okay i mean conclusion the aim of science the broad aim of science is to arrive at laws okay in mathematics suppose in physics in chemistry in bio we always try to arrive at laws that is established inductive generalizations which are only cryptic statements regarding as yet unmade observations by accumulating such established inductive uh, generalizations inductivists claimed that we will have at our disposal an enormous amount of observations uh, the totality of which the totality of which constitutes reality okay for for inductivists or uh, according to the inductivist schema according to the inductivist theory science begins with observations remains at the level of observations and ends with observations science cannot go beyond observations science arrives at laws arrives at conclusions only on the basis of observations if it is unobservable then uh, then the theory the law that we make okay uh, it is not legitimate it is not valid then what we have discussed till now the inductivism looked upon uh, 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 certainty and breadth as the hallmarks of scientific knowledge if if according to the inductivist schema the hallmarks of scientific knowledge are certainty and breadth then according to hypotheticism the hallmarks of scientific knowledge include novelty and depth okay that is to say science must aim at knowledge which is new okay one is novelty and depth okay that is to say science must aim at knowledge which is new in the sense of being trans observational and deep in the sense of referring to entities underlying the phenomena given to us in observations if in the inductivist schema science begins with observations remains at the level of observations and ends with observations then for the proponents of hypothesis 
for, for the proponents of rationalist philosophy of science, science begins only when it goes beyond observations, it is trans observational in nature. Okay? That is why it must be new, okay? it must go beyond observations okay? and it also must be deep in the sense of referring to entities underlying the phenomena given to us in observations. Okay? In other words, whereas inductivists insist that science must remain from beginning to the end at the level of observations, hypothesists maintain that science begins only when it goes beyond observations. According to hypothesis, genuine science must not remain content with generalizations based on observations, but must seek to explain observations in terms of the unobservable or deeper entities or processes. The term hypothesis in 17th century meant a statement regarding unobservable entities and processes, though today by, uh, by hypothesis we only mean a tentative solution to a problem or hunch. I mean what is a hypothesis? Hypothesis is a tentative solution to a problem or hunch. In research methods, what we use, uh, 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 people very often say that you no, know, you have to prove your hypothesis or disprove your hypothesis. But, uh, but STS scholars, they do not believe in proving or disproving uh, 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 one's hypothesis. A hypothesis may be tested right or wrong. If you are die hard in proving or disproving your hypothesis, then it hinders the tradition of cumulative knowledge production. In this sense, in the, in the hypothesis schema, genuine science must not remain content to its generalizations based only on observations, but must seek to explain observations in terms of the unobservable or deeper entities and processes. Okay? Whereas, there is no place for hypothesis in the inductivist scheme, the hypothesists maintain that the aim of science is to generate hypothesis to explain what we observe. The term theory implies a statement of a set of statements involving at least one theoretical term. A theoretical term for example, electron or proton unlike an observational term does not designate observable or measurable. That is what I, I initially said, this place everywhere you will find proton or electron, but you just cannot observe them. It goes beyond observation. That is why we tend to use rationalist philosophy of science to observe them. Okay? It is not simply through observation that we can uh, say that there is electron or proton. Okay? What is a theory then? A theory refers to a set of interrelated propositions or ideas intended to explain facts or events. I mean a theory always depicts some kind of interrelated propositions or ideas. It must have a purpose, it, its purpose lies in, in, prov it, its purpose lies in providing adequate explanation to a uh, to an event or to adequate explanation for an event for uh, 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 for any program of action uh, for any fact for any value and so on okay adequacy if you look at slightly deviate from this but uh, adequacy is based on different parameters okay adequacy is based on two parameters. Adequacy is based on or adequacy is examined at the level of meaning and also at the level of statistical generalizations. When I say statistical generalizations, I mean I want to follow a more quantitative positivistic, I mean we will we'll discuss positivism later on and also this, this I mean positivistic and pre-positivistic traditions. When I say 
adequacy can be examined in terms uh, uh, terms of meaning or uh, adequacy is based on the level of meaning okay what we see in the post positivistic term at the level of interpretive interpretative school of thought uh, propounded by max weber we'll do this when we when we discuss verstehen school of thought okay that's why uh, it is more qualitative uh, but but the controversy still remain whether uh, adequacy can be judged uh, only at the level of statistical generalizations or only at the level of meaning gen, uh, meanings we'll see okay but we must mediate the two okay uh, the distinction between the the crude distinction between the dichotomization uh, uh, the dichotomy that uh, 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 that it poses the, that these two terms poses I think uh, 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 we must uh, try to uh, 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 or, or the distinction between uh, uh, adequacy based on meaning and the and adequacy based on statistical generalization is not rigid, but porous. Okay. Okay. Then let us see Let us see uh, how inductivist suggested that uh, no, if you cannot observe something, then it is not real. And uh, uh, what uh, uh, hypothesis claim that no knowledge is generated only when you go beyond observations. Okay. It is not simply that only when you go beyond observations that is not real, that also may be real, that is also real. But inductivists argued that no, that is not real if you go beyond observations. Okay. Inductivists are basically empiricists, and empiricists maintain that anything which exists must be observable. Hence, a inductivists do not admit that theoretical term designates real entities. Okay. They contend that theoretical entities are fictitious entities conjured up by us for the purposes of either economic description of observations or prediction. Hence, according to inductivists, theories are not dis descriptions of a real world of unobservables. As against this, the hypothesists maintain that the theoretical terms designate real entities not given to us in observations and theories uh, are descriptions of a real world of unobservable entities. Therefore, while hypothesists are called realists, inductivists are called anti realists. Why? Precisely because for for hypothesis, uh, they always try to see the that the reality which is implicit in the unobservable entities. That's why they are called realists. Inductivists they do not believe in in anything which is unobservable, even if that is real, like proton, electron, and so on. Okay. That is why they are called anti realists. Inductivism and hypothesism were thus rival methodologies advocating antagonistic views regarding the methods of science. These two methodologies competed with each other for acceptance. Both had strong followers among scientists and philosophers as well. It is interesting to see. I mean, uh, 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 you will find uh, both scientists, I mean natural philosophers, science in fact science was coined by Wevel in the 19th century, earlier it, it used to be uh, uh, known as natural philosophy. And the kind of philosophy that we see today, uh, uh, that was a breakaway, uh, I mean uh, that, that got separated from 
uh, 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 that natural philosophy and we call it moral philosophy. Okay. Uh, that is why you will find from uh, the branches of both natural philosophy and moral philosophy they had uh, they, they support uh, some of them they supported inductivism as well as some of them supported hypothesis no doubt about it we will come to who supported which group we will see in the beginning what we find that hypothesis has an upper hand it had among its champions not only Descartes but also Boyle, Hooke, uh, Huygens and uh, other eminent scientists. But inductivism emerged as the dominant theory of scientific method in the early 18th century. How? Okay. The setback suffered by hypothesism and the consequent domination of the scene by inductivism are to be uh, traded to the fact that the, the method of induction had had its uh, adherent uh, Sir Isaac Newton, whose eminence as a scientist lent inductivism a remarkable scientific respectability. Because Newton was in favor of inductivism, he was he subscribed to the inductivist method. Okay. Indeed, the classic statement of the inductivist position came from Newton himself, epitomizing this position in the general scholium of his principia Newton says I mean this is uh, 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 the, the principia I mean uh, 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 this is a uh, work uh, uh, which drew attention of the entire globe uh, uh, where Newton says what is not deduced from phenomena I mean observations is to be called a hypothesis and hypothesis whether metaphysical or physical whether on occult qualities or mechanical have no place in experimental philosophy. In this philosophy, particular propositions are inferred from phenomena and afterwards rendered general by induction. When, when Newton discussed uh, in his magnum opus uh, principia that uh, no, what is not deduced from phenomena or observations is to be called a hypothesis and hypothesis whether metaphysical or physical, whether on occult qualities or mechanical have no place in experimental philosophy. Okay? Then he always subscribed to at least in this statement he subscribed to the philosophy of inductivism, okay? the inductivist method. Of course, Newton's own scientific practice was at variance with his inductivist uh, convictions. He entertained many metaphysical ideas which played an active role in his theorizing. Okay? I mean, uh, 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 if you go through the writings of Newton, you will find those things. However, the followers of Newton went by what Newton said than what he did. It is interesting to see. Okay. In order to continue the success, uh, uh, I mean, in order to continue the success story of Newton, the followers of Newton believed that it was necessary to practice literally Newton's inductivist message, which he said here that uh, what is not deduced from phenomena or observations is to be called a hypothesis, and hypothesis, whether metaphysical or physical, whether on occult qualities or uh, mechanical have no place in experimental philosophy. Okay? In this philosophy, particular propositions are inferred from phenomena and afterwards rendered general by induction. Okay? This is very important to understand. Okay? I mean, the followers of Newton, okay, they followed this, this uh, statement as an inductivist message. Since inductivism was cult of observations, the followers of Newton like Hells, uh, Borov uh, and Coates attempted to construct purely observational physics, observational chemistry and observational biology to further the cause of Newton, I mean the further, further the cause of the master. Okay? However, inductivism very soon began to face serious challenges. As early as 1740, and 1750s, 
they are begun to don the realization that many areas of scientific inquiry could not be forced to the inductivist framework. For example, if, if I give you certain examples that Franklin's fluid theory of electricity, the vibratory theory of heat, the Buffonian theory of organic molecules and uh, phlogiston chemistry etcetera that developed in the middle of the 19th century went against the spirit of the inductivist cult of observations as they involved reference to entities and processes. The scientific grounds against the inductivist position were cleared with the appearance of chemical and gravitational theories of uh, George La, uh, Lesage, the neurophysiological theories of David Hartley and the general matter theory of Roger uh, Boscovich. Okay? And these theories and these scientists accurately realized that their theories would face stiff opposition not so much on scientific considerations, but due to the methodological implications considered absolutely undesirable by the prevailing methodological orthodoxy namely inductivity. Okay. That is why methodological rationale assumed greater significance in this context. That is what we discussed in the context of organized skepticism that, that it is not simply an institutional obligation, but also a methodological obligation. Okay? It is a methodological rationale. Perhaps for this reason, these scientists, who, which I mean the, the scientists like uh, Sage, Hartley, uh, Boscovich and others, what they did, they felt the need for methodological legitimization in terms of an alternative model. It is this need which motivated them to resurrect the method of hypothesis. Try to understand now the transition from inductivism to hypothesis. And in their attempt to develop the method of hypothesis, these thinkers produced works of immense significance. Their works were followed by uh, those of uh, Sene Beer, best known for his work on photosynthesis, uh, Pierre Provost, the founder of the theory of heat exchange and many others. These scientists challenged the canons of scientific method, I mean canons of scientific method, I mean at that time that was in, uh, inductivism, uh, these scientists challenged the canons, the rules of scientific method as envisaged by the proponents of inductivism and in doing so, they had their professional interests also at stake. Because, uh, because of the ways in which you find that uh, the, these, these methods, they also became ideologically oriented. These uh, personal attributes, professional attributes, ideological attributes uh, became more significant in this context. Apart from these challenges from the protagonists of the met method of hypothesis, the method of induction also faced an, an internal crisis. David Hume, an eminent 18th century inductivist undermined it from within. It is interesting Hume. Hume was a prominent inductivist, no doubt about it. Okay? He showed that the very principle of induction, I mean principle of induction I repeat from particular instances to arrive at a concrete generalization. And the principle of hypothesis that we have discussed that is from a general statement to a particular instance. Okay? That the way Hume showed that the very principle of induction which allowed us to proceed from observed to as yet unobserved phenomenon itself stood unjustified. Any attempt to justify the principle of induction Hume conclusively shows results in circularity or infinite regress. Hume was himself an inductivist, he did not accept the method of hypothesis because of his commitment to empiricity, which is based on experience, which is based on observation. Okay? And he concludes that since we have no alternative to the principle of induction, our belief is irrational. We have to 
boldly accept that the whole of our knowledge including science the paradox the paragon of knowledge rests on an irrational belief and animal faith okay why why did he say that uh, that uh, the very principle of induction which allowed us to proceed from observed to as yet unobserved phenomena itself stood unjustified and any attempt to justify the principle of induction results in circularity or infinite progress. If I tell you uh, students that uh, uh, no uh, uh, if I tell you friends that uh, all crows are black I have seen all crows. Can I make this statement that uh, in, in logic that I have seen all crows, I have seen x 1 crow, I have seen uh, 1 crow, 2 crows, 3 crows, 100 crows, 1000 crows, 10,000 crows, 1 lakh crows, 1 crore crows, but then have I seen all crows in the world? Then in the inductivist schema which Hume thought that no, there may be some crow which is non black. People very often say that no, all swans are white. Have I seen all swans in the globe? There may be a non white swan. In this sense, how many, how many observations are adequate to con come to a conclusion? that there is a limitation of such kind of statistical generalizations, right. I mean one must understand the, the, these uh, under what kind of limiting conditions we want to say uh, all crows are black or all swans are white. Okay? In this sense though he himself was an uh, uh, inductivist he concludes uh, that since we have no alternative to the principle of induction, our belief is irrational and we have to boldly accept that the whole of our knowledge including science, the paragon of knowledge rests on an irrational belief and animal faith. After Hume, the followers of Newton, I mean the, the inductivists attempted to show that Hume was wrong in the in his contention that uh, the principle of induction could not be justified. I mean precisely because they wanted to go ahead with only Newton, I mean those who rejected uh, Hume. The most significant attempt in this connection was made by John Stuart Mill, who realized that the main point of the attack on induction was the inability to lend the claims based on it, the degree of certainty comparable to deductive inferences. For example, uh, for example, in a deductive inference such as all men are mortal x is a man with certainty that is to say given the truth of the premises the truth of the conclusion necessarily follows. But in an inductive inference where the premises are about particular observations and the conclusion is a generalization the generalization does not necessarily follow. That is to say given the truth of the statements about certain particular observations this, this portion is very important please that is to say given the truth of the statements about certain particular observations the truth of the generalization is not guaranteed the generalization is at best a probable one. Okay? This is for John Stuart Mill that is why logicians like Aristotle could develop a system of rules for deductive inferences. Okay? Um, uh, John Stuart Mill also did that, uh, uh, that uh, by knowing these rules we could find which of our uh, conclusions necessarily follow and which do not necessarily follow. John Stuart Mill took the, the, the cousins in favor of the method of induction which he attempted to demonstrate to the uh, to be on on equal footing with the rules of deduction whose capacity to lend certainty to the claims based on them was unproblematic 
In other words, John Stuart Mill set out to construct an inductive logic which was supposed to be almost on par with deductive logic. He uh, let me quote Mill here that the business of inductive logic is to provide rules and models such as syllogism and its rules are for rationation to which if inductive arguments confirm those arguments are conclusive. I mean you know, syllogism means mediate deductive inference uh, that is found in logic uh, if somebody is very interested uh, in, uh, in uh, logic for that uh, people can refer to that. Uh, immediate deductive inference, mediate deductive inference and syllogism is alternatively known as mediate deductive inference. And those rules which, which even Aristotle could develop a system of rules for deductive inferences in logic. Okay. Mill tried to provide five such rules. He conceived of five, or five such rules and articulated them. What are those five rules? One, the method of agreement. Two, the method of difference. Three, the joint method of agreement and difference. Four, the method of residue. And five, the method of concomitant variation. And Mill claims uh, for these methods the dual role of adding discoveries and uh, proving or disproving our claims with certainty that definitiveness. Okay? That is their role is both instrumental and demonstrative. Their role when I say uh, when Mill said uh, their role is instrumental I mean their role is goal oriented their goal must their their, uh, their action uh, must have instrumental rationality their uh, they must have a goal oriented uh, uh, social action and so on. and when he said uh, their role is must be demonstrative i mean whatever uh, uh, claim that you are making you must be able to show it uh, to the wider public to the wider scientific community for for uh, 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 I mean uh, for Mill, uh, even if even if there is, there is there is no method of discovery, it would not be less true that they are the sole methods of proof. I mean Mill's methods fail to perform either of the two functions for the simple reason that uh, in either case the successful performance involves factors that go beyond the methods or rules that uh, Mill has proposed. It is obvious that these methods, I mean the method of uh, uh, no, agreement, the method of difference, the joint method of agreement and difference, the method of residues and the method of concomitant variations okay, cannot solve the purpose of discovery. That is cannot be sufficient as instruments for uh, theory formation. For if that were so, by now all the problems of science could have been solved by proposing answers mastering the use of these rules which are only mechanical. The formation of a theory involves factors which go beyond these methods, but what is more important is that even after a theory is proposed, verified and established it cannot be demonstrated or proved in a manner comparable to deductive. 